What's up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York, and on the phone we got Tommy of the Almighty Prong. Thank you for your time today, man. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So you have this new uh, EP coming out, Age of Defiance, which features two brand new tracks as well as three live cuts. What I'm curious is, these two new tracks, could this like serve as maybe like a preview of what the next full-length Prong record is going to sound like, or is this like something that kind of stands out a little bit more in the Prong discography? Uh, I think the latter is true. Probably stands out. I have no idea what the next full length is going to be. If there's going to be one, I mean, uh, who knows? But uh, uh, I don't. I don't see it as a precursor to anything. It's just is what it is. Uh, I really enjoy doing this, where it's just doing two songs. I just felt that there was a lot more attention to those two than having that uh, major project of fifteen songs, and you have to tackle all that to do a record so this was cool uh, I wouldn't mind doing a series of singles or uh, you know EPs yeah I mean uh, I could definitely tell but you only you have so many albums now from Zero Days to Ruining Lives to Carved Into Stone so many albums like have you always taken a new approach to every single album you make or does Prong have kind of like a usual template that ties everything together uh, they've been really different, uh, as you can tell from listening to them. The only ones that have, I think, some consistency are the ones you just mentioned, actually, will, uh, apart from uh, is, uh, Zero Days and No Absolutes are the ones that were done in similar fashion. Uh, but all the other ones, it's just been whatever was happening at that time, and you know, however I felt, and uh, you know, it's been different occasions, each record. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd imagine that No Absolutes and Zero Days have some similarities, being that, like, didn't they come out, like, within a year of each other or something like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were they close together, it's true. Yeah. But it was a different session. I mean, the, the, the writing and the recording were different sessions. It's just we tackled it the same way. Uh, I thought that uh, No Absolutes came out really well. and That's always fearful of me. When, I, when a record comes out really well, it... You know, to do the same exact thing the next time, this seems uh, redundant, and I think that's hurt my career a lot. I mean, I, I just always feel like, well, that one came out cool, let's try something else. So uh, when we did Zero Day, I was like, I made sure I didn't go that route. Was, uh, let's try a record that's similar, you know? So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that worked either. Yeah. I think you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you do the same thing, you're repetitive. If you experiment, you sell out. I feel like there's no winners, right? Especially with prom. Because we don't really fit into any genre, and uh, uh, the critics have been less than favorable to us throughout the career. And, uh, you know, we've always sort of been under the radar, so no one really knows how to treat the band or approach it or write about it or what have you it's just sort of like okay these guys are making records and uh yeah i guess it's pretty cool you know that's sort of what we get mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you mentioned that like with the making of each record being so different like they are kind of representative of like who you were at that time was there like a preconceived idea on how you wanted every record to sound or was there like a lot of improvising and things happened organically not a lot of improvising I mean, now with, with digital technology uh you know, we have a, a good series of demos that are made, and then things are lifted from those and put into the album. So uh, there's not a lot of surprises anymore. Uh, it's not like the 60s where you went in and smoked a bunch of weed and did acid and, uh, you know, made a record. It's sort of everything that's a it's different schedule and approach to things, and we have it all outlined because, you know, cost effectiveness and uh, making sure that this thing's delivered on time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd imagine. And I mean, when it comes to like it representing of that time, does that influence the lyrics as well? Like, do you need to hear music to come up with lyrics, or is there a concept that could help determine the music itself? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, that changes as, as, as well, where at times I feel like I want to write down ideas and uh, from not playing guitar or thinking of lyrics and uh, ideas that can be lyrics so uh, again now with digital technology or your smartphones like 
pull out my phone and write a lyric. And then later when I have to put a, a vocal melody or a lyric to a song, I have a, a, a bunch of ideas and I go, oh, well, that, that works. So that matches the song or the music. So uh, that's how usually it's done. But sometimes, uh, you know, I'll, I'll directly write a chorus or something from a lyric that's already written. It happens occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, does inspiration like come out of nowhere sometimes, or do you have to kind of like put yourself into a certain element in order for like to get into songwriting mode? I have in the past where um, you know there's a book called The Artist Way, and it gives you suggestions on what to do. Uh, you know, there's, there's such thing as writer's block, or you're not being inspired, uh, etc. So. Um, you know, I haven't had that experience recently, uh, but sometimes you have to do that. That's why, you know, you always have to hear stories of old rockumentaries where these guys went to, went to south of France to write a record or, you know, uh, you know uh, did whatever, you know, it's in order to get inspiration. But uh, there's enough roaming around uh, in daily life to, to pick stuff out and you get inspired and, uh, again, it's a, it's not like I have to go into a, a room with a, a pen, paper these days. I, you know, you, you, we're all attached to these devices that can uh, document our feelings. <laughs> you know, even speak into the phone at this point. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Right. Now, exactly. What I was curious is because you know you are a very prolific artist. Aside from you know many prom albums coming out, but you know you've played with Danzig, you played with Ministry. I had maybe playing with other artists has maybe given you some other ideas on how to incorporate new stuff into prom as well. well I've learned a lot. I mean, playing you know with watching Al Jorgensen, I've learned uh, you know definitely learned a lot from Glenn. Uh, you know, learn from Rob Zombie and, uh, you know, Trent Reznor, guys that I've done sessions with. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I try to learn stuff, but, uh, you know, again, Prong is my baby. I have a whole other approach to stuff. I learned a lot from Chris Collier, who's worked on the last uh, batch of records. I've learned from Steve Evitz uh, and uh, Terry Day, you know, the producers. Like, I tend to pick guys that are going to uh, be sort of, Tutors to me as well, where uh, I can pick things up, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really go into a record and go into these sessions like trying to dictate anything with Tom. I sort of, uh, I can find one guy that I'm going to work with and uh, let him uh, make a lot of decisions, and then uh, if I really feel strongly against it, I'll, you know, oppose him. So, but usually, uh, they're usually beating me up in the studio. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> well, because being also a producer, I'd imagine that like when, when you're working with other artists on like their material, like when you collaborated with Soulfly, for example, for oh, right. guest vocals, I'd imagine that like they are reaching out to you because they want you to bring a little bit of your own mix and a little bit of your own hand to their work as well, right? I don't know, with Max works was so fast, I mean, and uh, I, that was with, Bun with with Logan Maynard on that, and those guys, they have it down, so I don't think they really leaned on me for anything, they just wanted, uh, you know, I'm friends with Max, and he was just doing me a favor, really, so uh, on that occasion, it was, like, those guys are a lot better at making records, I think, than I am, they I had a rapid pace, mm -hmm. but um, uh, other occasions, yeah, I mean, like, you know, again, with Al, you know, Al was sort of uh, at, at a loss for, like, guitar parts or, uh, you know, songs in general. And he's just, like, you know, threw me in a studio and trusted me to, uh, you know, come up with a bunch of riffs and, you know, work with the drummer. And then he came in later, you know, fixed stuff up. So a lot of times, for, you know, the guys that are you know, want, need some, me to come in and spark the project. Like, you know, with Glenn, sort of the same way. Glenn, Glenn works really fast, like unbelievably fast, where, you know, he knows that I can do that. So he, he's like, you know, uh, here's, <laughs> with him, it's ridiculous. With this, it's like, here's four songs. I want you to do all the guitar tracks today, you know, and that's weirdly what I do, you know. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like it's different, different 
situations, yeah. uh, different things. But um, you know, I mean, I you know, it's, I, if I work with a, a younger band or somebody else like that, I haven't really done that in a really long time. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure I could bring a lot to the table. Yeah. Uh, especially with vocals now, I've learned so much about cutting vocals in the last six years that uh, you know, a lot of tricks, a lot of good things now. Yeah, of course, of course. And when it comes to like songwriting, it's one thing to be able to write a good song and being able to play your instrument, but like also playing live is a completely different like experience. Yeah. Like I'd imagine that when you're playing live, you almost have to kind of like switch mind frames a little bit, right? Oh, totally. Uh, one thing that I have to do is uh, is the, when you write a song and you're you're not really thinking about what you're going to be playing live. So eventually I, I have to learn how to sing and play these things at the same time. So uh, that's a whole other process that I never look forward to doing. Uh, like it, it takes weeks and weeks and weeks of, of repetition on how to uh, do that because uh, I'm not really a natural at it. Like, you know, I'll, have, I'll learn the guitar part to where uh, I don't have to think about it anymore. Then I got to remember... Uh, you uh, memorize the lyric, and then uh, and then taking now again with you know we have pro tools and so psychology. I'll, I'll just keep rehearsing a, a verse over and over and over again to where I don't have to think about it. like I'm thinking about you know the Jets game or something, and uh, you know I'm, I'm able to sing and play. It has to get to that point. So when I go out, you know, and do a gig when there's all these distractions and problems that you know always have you know when, when you're on the road that I, I don't even think about what I'm doing anymore you know it just comes totally natural yeah but that, after a lot of practice I mean you know some guys have brilliant me musical memories like and I've, I've experienced this with several musicians where they'll listen to a song figure it out and then they never forget it you know we're in the same thing with a lyric and you know, as people do karaoke, you go and you're like, how do they remember these lyrics? Like, you know, that even looking at the screen. But like, forget it with me. Like, I still have a problem remembering my own lyrics. I just got to keep reminding myself. There's a lot of repetition, a lot of practice that goes involved with that. Of course, practice makes perfect. But, like, going along with, like, the, the live presence, because it's not even just playing the material live. There's crowd interaction. Like, uh, one example is I have a couple friends who don't like hardcore music at all, but they love going to hardcore shows just because of, like, the... Uh -huh the fulfillment and the interaction aspect behind it. So I'm, so maybe like the live presence is also kind of like, you know, it's always a different experience seeing a band live versus listening to them. I'd imagine playing live versus writing is also a completely different experience. Yeah, I wish I had that down better. I mean, there's bands that uh, sort of instinctually know what a crowd is going to react to. Uh, if that's happened with prom, it's been totally by accident. Like, I have no idea uh, on a live situation, like, how people can react. Like, I've never been a mosher. I've never gone in the pit, like, maybe once in my life. And, uh, you know, it's just not my thing. So, uh, you know, like, I, I, I don't know. So Never say never. Uh, so we go up. Yeah, no, I say never. Uh, I'm, I'm, I bang into somebody nowadays, and I'm like in pain. So whatever. <laughs> there you go. I have uh, two more questions for you. If that's cool, um, I, I love asking every artist this because this is always the hardest question for everybody to answer. And from what you told me, I think this would be a good uh, answer from you. How do you know when a song is done? It's never a song is never a hundred percent done. Uh, you just know when to stop, which means that it, it, it gets past that threshold of like an eighty percent done. Which means you know what we put enough time into this, and that's it. So it's it, it, it it's. Uh, I've made so many records I'm not bragging or anything and I've done this so long and I've made so many mistakes of overworking songs that uh, it just gets to the point where I'm like no it, it, it's over mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's become instinctual it's like I, I 
I, I know when you're starting to overwork, let's put it that way, I know when you get into that overwork mode where you start getting confused, and that's where, uh, that's, you know, where I stop. Like, you know, and I could point to, like, this, this new age of the science record, there's a song, End the Sanity, on there. The new, it's, a, it's a, I'm really happy about this song because uh, I, I really did not overwork it, and I, it, it was, it came together really fast. So it was, um, uh, those are the times when I'm like really happy and I know when to stop is when a song comes together really fast and you write the lyric real fast and you're like, I'm not going any further. So, uh, you know, those are the, the, some of the outlines with it. Not every song's the same, so, you know, you treat it differently. But, you know, I don't think any song is ever completely done. I think, you know, it's, you, you get to an 80% threshold then you say stop. That's a good way of putting it. And uh, the final question I wanted to ask you is because prong originated from New York City, right? Yes. Okay, so, you know, and being that you started in, like, 1986, you know, during, like, the hardcore movement and so many great bands coming from here, obviously, you know, CBGBs and Lemores and all that, is was there, like, were you like active in the hardcore scene in New York City or was like the goal of prong to kind of get outside New York City a little bit more to help get the name out there? Well, both. I mean, I worked at CBGB. I was uh, the, the house sound guy there from 86 to 90 and I did all the hardcore matinees. Like, I, I was the sound guy at the matinees. So, uh, you know, I was very part of the scene. Like, people know me from that. You know, I mixed everybody. So, uh, you know, it's like, um, but Pong was not a hardcore band. I mean, we, we played matinees because, you know, I was like friends with like Ray Bees and we played with Warzone and I was, you know, I was friends with Roger and Vinny and, you know, like, you know, the Crumbs and, you know, Ludacris and a lot of the metalcore bands, you know, so, you know, Sheer Tara were my best, they still, you know, Mark Newman is still one of my best friends and, you know, these guys are, you know, go way back. So, you know, we played a lot of shows with them. But Tom wanted, I mean, and it's still like that, we're, we, we're on our own, dude. Like, we just have our own thing, and, uh, you know, we take a lot from hardcore, but, uh, you know, we took a lot from the whole Lower East Side scene, which, the whole Noise New York scene. I mean, I think that there's just the amount, that we have the same amount of Chromags and the same amount of Swans in Tom, and, you know, that we also have a lot of British influence, too. So there's, you know, uh, a lot of post-punk killing joke is a huge part of uh, sound, too. So it's a, it's a combination of a lot of things, we, you know, and, uh, you know, Prong became more popular in Europe than we did in America, and I think we're still more popular in Europe than we were in the States. Mm, it's a whole other world out there. It's gotten closer in recent years, uh, but it's, it is different. Yeah, like I heard Saxon played like a not even sold out show at BB King's one time. I think like maybe a hundred people there tops, and then like they played like a stadium in like Sweden for like thousands right. of people. You know, so that, yeah, Saxon's a good example of that difference. And, uh, I mean, Saxon are unbelievably good. And yeah. It's a shame. I think Americans are so uh, dictated by mass media. And, you know, over there, they don't care as much. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, outside of England, I think it's the English language has a lot to do with it. Like, England and America care so much about what, what the magazines are saying or, like, or with mass media. Everyone is, has a, a, a urgency to fit into this uh, mass populace more than... The Germans, for instance, are like, you know, we don't care about that stuff. We have our own scene and... You know, metal is metal, and uh, it's never going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. A very good way of putting it. So before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, bro. Very good interview. Thank you. thank you. Is there just anything else you would like to promote? We just finished up like a month and a half with uh, Agnostic Fun. We had a couple of eight week shows amidst that. So uh, we're going out with Unearthed in Europe uh, in February. So uh, that's the next thing that's happening. Oh, they're great guys. I got damn stuff going on. But anyhow, go, go to Fun the Band on Instagram. On music.com, we got a bunch of crazy stuff for sale up there, and uh, yeah, you can pre-order the Age of Defiance 
vinyl or CD uh, through Steam Hammer Records and uh, you know go to the Instagram there's, there's a link up there etc so uh, you know, follow the band Instagram follow music go on Facebook and on shopmusic.com so check it out thank you so much Tommy appreciate it Everybody, thank you, man. Everybody, we are here with Tommy Victor of Prong. Be sure to pick up the Age of Defiance EP when it comes out. This is Alex from Heavy New York. We'll see you next time.